Hey everyone. In the um, in the tradition of following threads, I'd like to explore a little bit further. So, going down the rabbit hole from the anti-fascistish action, commonly known under its abbreviation Antifa was a militant anti-fascist organization in Weimar Republic started by members of the Communist Party of Germany that existed from 1932 to 33. So let's learn a bit more about the Communist Party of Germany. Communistische Partei Deutschland, KPD, was a major political party in the Weimar Republic between 1918 and 1933, an underground resistance movement in Nazi Germany and a minor party in West Germany in the post-war period until it was banned in 1956. The symbol picture here is a red star with a hammer and sickle. Founded in the aftermath of the First World War by socialists who had opposed the war, the party became gradually ever more committed to Leninism and later Stalinism after the death of its founding figures. During the Weimar Republic period, the KPD usually polled between 10 and 15 percent of the vote and was represented in the National Reichstag and in state parliaments. Under the leadership of Ernst Thalmann from 1925, the party became staunchly Stalinist and loyal to the leadership of the Soviet Union, and from 1928 it was largely controlled and funded by the Comintern in Moscow. Under Thalmann's leadership, the party directed most of its attacks against the Social Democratic Party of Germany, which it regarded as its main adversary and re referred to as social fascists. The KPD considered all other parties in the Weimar Republic to be fascists. The KPD was banned in the Weimar Republic one day after the Nazi Party emerged triumphant in the German elections in 1933. It maintained an underground organisation in Nazi Germany and the KPD and groups associated with it led the internal resistance to the Nazi regime with a focus on distributing anti-Nazi literature. The KPD suffered heavy losses between 1933 to 39, with 30,000 communists executed and 150,000 sent to Nazi concentration camps. The party was revived in divided post-war West and East Germany and won seats in the first Bundestag West German Parliament elections in 1949, but its support collapsed following the establishment of a communist state in the Soviet occupation zone in the east. The KPD was banned as extremist in West Germany in 1956 by the Constitutional Court. In 1969, some of its former members founded an even smaller fringe party, the German Communist Party, DKP, which remains legal and multiple tiny splinter groups claiming to be the successor to the KPD have also subsequently been formed. In East Germany, the party was merged by Soviet decree with remnants of the Social Democratic Party to form the Socialist Unity Party, SED, which ruled East Germany from 1949 until 1989 to 90. The forced merger was opposed by the Social Democrats, many of whom fled to the Western Zones after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Reformists took over the SED and renamed it the Party of Democratic Socialism, PDS. In 2007, the PDS subsequently merged with the SPD splinter faction, WASG, to form Die Link. Early History Before the First World War, the Social Democratic Party was the largest party in Germany and the world's most, most successful socialist party. Although still officially claiming to be a Marxist party, 
By 1914, it had, it had become in practice a reformist party. In 1914, the SPD, members of the Reichstag, voted in favour of the war. Left-wing members of the party, led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, strongly opposed the war and the SPD soon suffered a split, with the leftists forming the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany, the USPD. And the more radical Spartacist League. In November 1918, revolution broke out across Germany. The leftists, led by Rosa Luxemburg and the Spartacist League, formed the KPD at a founding congress held in Berlin on 30th of December 1918 to 1st of January 1919 in the reception hall of the city council. After, apart from the Sp Spartacists, another dissent group of socialists called the International Communists of Germany, also dissenting members of the Social Democratic Party, but mainly located in Hamburg, Bremen and Northern Germany, joined the Young Party, the Revolutionary Shop Stewards, a network of dissenting socialist trade unionists centred in Berlin, were also invited to the Congress but eventually did not join the party because they deemed the founding Congress leaning into a syndicalist direction. There were seven main reports given at the founding Congress. Economic Struggles by Paul Lang, Greeting Speech by Karl Radek, International Conferences by Hermann Duncker, Our Organization by Hugo Eberlin, Our Program by Rosa Luxemburg, The Crisis of the USPD by Karl Liebknecht, The National Assembly by Paul Levy. These reports were given by leading figures of the Spartacist League, however, members of the International Kommunisten Deutschland also took part in the discussions. Under the leadership of Liebknecht and Luxembourg, the KPD was committed to a revolution in Germany, and during 1919 and 1920, attempts to seize control of the government continued. Germany's social democratic government, which had come to power after the fall of the monarchy, was vehemently opposed to the KPD's idea of socialism. With the new regime terrified of a Bolshevik revolution in Germany, Defence Minister Gustav Nosk formed a series of anti-communist paramilitary groups dubbed Freikorps out of demobilised World War I veterans. During the failed Spartacist uprising in Berlin of January 1919, Liebknecht and Luxembourg, who had not initiated the uprising but joined once it had begun, were captured by the Freikorps and murdered. The party split a few months later into two factions, the KPD and the Communist Workers' Party of Germany, the KAPD. Following the assassination of Leo Jogiches, Paul Levy became the KPD leader. Other prominent members included Clara Zetkin, Paul Froelich, Hugo Eberlin, Franz Mehring, August Talheimer, and Ernst Meyer. Levy led the party away from the policy of immediate revolution in an effort to win over SPD and USPD voters and trade union officials. These efforts were rewarded when a substantial section of the USPD joined the KPD, making it a mass party for the first time. Through the 1920s, the KPD was racked by internal conflict between more and less radical factions, partly reflecting the power struggles between Zinoviev and Stalin in Moscow. Germany was seen as being of central importance to the struggle for socialism, and the failure of the German Revolution was a major setback. Eventually, Levy was expelled in 1921 by the Comintern for indiscipline. Further leadership changes took place in the 1920s. Supporters of the left or right opposition to the Stalin-controlled Comintern leadership were expelled. Of these, Heinrich Brandler, August Talheimer and Paul Froelich set up a splinter Communist Party opposition. Weimar Republic years 
A new KPD leadership more favourable to the Soviet Union was elected in 1923. This leadership, headed by Ernst Talman, abandoned the goal of immediate revolution and from 1924 onwards contested Reichstag elections with some successes. In the first five years of Talman's leadership, the KPD broadly followed the United Front policy developed in the early 1920s of working with other working class and socialist parties to contest elections, pursue social struggles and fight the rising right-wing militias. During the years of the Weimar Republic, the KPD was the largest communist party in Europe and was seen as the leading party of the communist movement outside the Soviet Union. It maintained a solid electoral performance, usually polling more than 10% of the vote and gaining 100 deputies in November 1932 elections. In the presidential election of the same year, Talman took 13.2% of the vote compared to Hitler's 30 Under Talman's leadership, the party was closely aligned with the Soviet leadership headed by Joseph Stalin, and from 1928, the party was largely controlled and funded by Comintern in Moscow. The party's first paramilitary wing was the Rota Front Kampfverband, Alliance of Red Front Fighters, which was banned by the governing Social Democrats in 1929. Aligning with the Comintern's ultra-left third period, the KPD abruptly turned to viewing the Social Democratic Party of Germany, SPD, as its main adversary. In this period, the KPD referred to the SPD as social fascists. The term social fascism was introduced to the German Communist Party shortly after the Hamburg Uprising of 1923 and gradually became ever more influential in the party. By 1929, it was being propagated as the theory. The KPD regarded itself as the only anti-fascist party in Germany and held that all other parties in the Weimar Republic were fascist. Nevertheless, it cooperated with the Nazis in the early 1930s in attacking the Social Democrats and both sought to destroy the liberal democracy of the Weimar Republic. In the early 1930s, the KPD sought to appeal to Nazi voters with nationalistic slogans, and in 1931 the KPD had united with the Nazis, whom they then referred to as working people's comrades, in an unsuccessful attempt to bring down the Social Democrat state government of Prussia by means of plebiscite. During the joint KPD and Nazi campaign to dissolve the Prussian parliament, Berlin police captains Paul Anlauf and Franz Lenk were assassinated in Bulauplatz by Erich Milke and Erich Zima, who were members of the KPD's paramilitary wing. The Parti Selbstschutz. The detailed planning for the murders had been carried out by KPD members of the Reichstag, Heinz Newman and Hans Kippenberger, based on orders issued by Walter Albrecht. The party's leaders in the Berlin-Brandenburg region, Schüter Erich Milke, who later became the head of the East German secret police, would only face trial for the murders in 1933. In this period, while also opposed to the Nazis, the KPD regarded the Nazi party as a less sophisticated and thus less dangerous fascist party than the SPD, and KPD leader Ernst Thälmann declared that Some Nazi trees must not be allowed to overshadow a forest of social democrats. Critics of the KPD accuse it of having pursued a sectarian policy, e.g. the Social Democratic Party, criticised the KPD's thesis of social fascism, which addressed the SPD as the communists' main enemy, and both Leon Trotsky from the Comintern's left opposition and August Talheimer of the right opposition continued to argue for a united front. Critics believed that the KPD sectarianism scuttled any possibility of a united front with the SPD against the rising power of the National Socialists. These allegations were repudiated by supporters of the KPD, as it was said. The right-wing leadership of the SPD rejected the proposals of the KPD to unite for the defeat of fascism. The SPD leaders were accused of having countered KPD efforts to form a united front on the working class. For instance, after Franz von Papen's government carried out a coup d'etat in Prussia, the KPD called for 
for a general strike and turned to the SPD leadership for joint struggle, but the SPD leaders again refused to cooperate with the KPD. In 1932, as the party began to shift focus to the fascist threat, the KPD founded Anti-Fascistische Action, commonly known as Antifa, which it described as a red united front under the leadership of the only anti-fascist party, the KPD. Nazi era. On 27th February, soon after the appointment of Adolf Hitler as Chancellor, the Reichstag was set on fire and Dutch Council Communist Marinus van der Lubbe was found near the building. The Nazis publicly blamed the fire on communist agitators in general, although in a German court in 1933 it was decided that van der Lubbe had acted alone as he claimed to have done. The following day Hitler persuaded Hindenburg to issue the Reichstag fire decree. It suspended the civil liberties enshrined in the Constitution, ostensibly to deal with the communist acts of violence. Repression began within hours of the fire when police arrested dozens of communists. Although Hitler could have formally banned the KPD, he did not do so right away. Not only was he reluctant to chance a violent uprising, but he believed the KPD could siphon off SPD votes and split the left. However, most judges held the KPD responsible for the fire and took the line that KPD membership was in and of itself a treasonous act. At the March 1933 election, the KPD elected 81 deputies. However, it was an open secret that they would never be allowed to take up their seats. They were all arrested in short order for all intents and purposes. The KPD was outlawed on the day the Reichstag fire decree was issued and completely banned as of the 6th of March, the day after the election. Shortly after the election, the Nazis pushed through the Enabling Act, which allowed the cabinet in practice Hitler to enact laws without the involvement of the Reichstag, effectively giving Hitler dictatorial powers. Since the bill was effectively a constitutional amendment, a quorum of two-thirds of the entire Reichstag had to be present in order to formally call up the bill, leaving nothing to chance Reichstag President Hermann Göring did not count the KPD seats for purposes of obtaining the required quorum. This led historian Richard J. Evans to contend that the Enabling Act had been passed in a manner contrary to law. The Nazis did not need to count the KPD deputies for purposes of getting a supermajority of two-thirds of those deputies present and voting. However, Evans argued not counting the KPD deputies for purposes of a quorum amounted to refusing to recognize their existence and was thus an illegal act. The KPD was efficiently suppressed by the Nazis. The most senior KPD leaders were Wilhelm Pieck and Walter Ulbricht, who went into exile in the Soviet Union. The KPD maintained an underground organization in Germany throughout the Nazi period but the loss of many core members severely weakened the party's infrastructure. The Purge of 1937 A number of senior KPD leaders in exile were caught up in Joseph Stalin's Great Purge of 1937 and 38 and executed. Among them, Hugo Eberlin, Heinz Newman, Hermann Rommel, Fritz Schult and Hermann Schubert, or sent to the Gulag, like Marguerite Buber Newman, still others like Gustav von Wangenheim and Erich Milke, later the head of the Stasi in East Germany, denounced their fellow exiles to the NKVD. Willy Munzenberg, the KPD's propaganda chief, was murdered in mysterious circumstances in France in 1940. The NKVD is believed to have been responsible. Post-war history In East Germany, the Soviet occupation authorities forced the eastern branch of the SPD to merge with the KPD, led by Pieck and Ulbricht, to form the Socialist Unity Party, SED, in April 1946. Although nominally, nominally a union of equals, the SED quickly fell under communist domination, 
and most of the more recalcitrant members from the SPD side of the merger were pushed out in short order. By the time of the formal formation of the East German state in 1949, the SED was a full-fledged communist party and developed along lines similar to other Soviet bloc communist parties. It was the ruling party in East Germany from its formation in 1949 until 1989. The SPD managed to preserve its independence in Berlin, forcing the SED to form a small branch in West Berlin, the Socialist Unity Party of West Berlin. The KPD reorganized in the western part of Germany and received 5.7% of the vote in the first Bundestag election in 1949. But the onset of the Cold War and the subsequent widespread repression of the far left soon caused a collapse in the party's support. At the 1953 election, the KPD only won 2.2% of the total votes and lost all of its seats, never to return. The party was banned in August 1956 by the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany. The decision was upheld by the European Commission of Human Rights in Communist Party of Germany v. the Federal Republic of Germany. The ban was due to the aggressive and combative methods that the party used as a Marxist-Leninist party struggle to achieve their goals. After the party was declared illegal, many of its members continued to function clandestinely. Despite increased government surveillance, part of its membership refounded the party in 1968 as the German Communist Party, DKP. Following German reunification, many DKP members joined the new party of democratic socialism formed out of the remains of the SED. In 1968, a self-named true successor to the banned West German KPD was formed, the KPD-ML, Marxist-Leninist which followed Maoist ideas. It went through multiple splits and he united with a Trotskyist group in 1986 to form the, Un- the Unified Socialist Party, the VSP, which failed to gain any influence and dissolved in the early 1990s. However, multiple tiny splinter groups originating in the KPDML still exist, several of which claim the name of KPD. Another party with this name was formed in 1990 in East Berlin by several hardline communists who had been expelled from the PDS, including Erich Honecker. The KPD, brackets, Bolshevik, split off from the East German KPD in 2005, bringing the total number of more or less active KPDs to at least five. The left, formed out of a merger between the PDS and Labour and Social Justice, the Electoral Alternative, in 2007, claims to be the historical successor of the KPD by way of the PDS. Organisation. In the early 1920s, the party operated under the principle of democratic centralism, whereby the leading body of the party was the Congress, meeting at least once a year, Between Congresses, leadership of the party resided in the Central Committee, which was elected at the Congress of one group of people who had to live where the leadership was resident and formed the Zentrale and others nominated from the districts they represented but also elected at the Congress, who represented the wider party. Elected figures were subject to recall by the bodies that elected them. The KPD employed around... 200 full-timers during its early years of existence, and as Bro notes, they received the pay of an average skilled worker and had no privileges apart from being the first to be arrested, prosecuted and sentenced, and when shooting started, to be the first to fall. There's a section on election results. So <clears throat> the next theme that I wanted to explore was this common turn So at the start of this article they talk about um 
During the Weimar Republic period, the KPD usually polled between 10 and 15 percent of the vote and was represented in the National Reichstag and in state parliaments. Under the leadership of Ernst Thälmann from 1925, the party became staunchly Stalinist and loyal to the leadership of the Soviet Union, and from 1928 it was largely controlled and funded by the Com intern in Moscow. So, so reading the Com intern page, its title is Communist International. And also redirects from Third International. The Communist International Comintern, known also as the Third International, 1919 to 1943, was an international organization that advocated world communism. The Comintern resolved at its Second Congress to struggle by all available means, including armed force, for the overthrow of the international bourgeoisie and the creation of an international Soviet Republic as a transition stage to the complete abolition of the state. The Comintern had been preceded by the 1916 dissolution of the Second International. So it was founded by Vladimir Lenin. There's a symbol of the world with a hammer and sickle. Succeeded by Communist Information Bureau. Ideology Communism, Marxism, Marxism Leninism. The picture the Communist International published, a namesake theoretical magazine in a variety of European languages from 1919 to 1943. The Comintern held seven world congresses in Moscow between 1919 and 1935. During that period, it also conducted 13 enlarged plenums of its governing executive committee, which had much the same function as the somewhat larger and more grandiose congresses. Stalin, head of the Soviet Union, dissolved the Comintern in 1943 to avoid antagonizing his allies in the latter years of World War II, the United States and the United Kingdom. Organizational History Failure of the Second International Differences between the revolutionary and reformist wings of the workers' movement have been increasing for decades, but the outbreak of the Great War was the catalyst for their separation. The Triple Alliance comprised two empires, while the Triple Entente was formed by France and Britain with the Russian Empire. Socialists had historically been anti-war and internationalist, fighting against what they perceived as militarist exploitation of the proletariat for bourgeois, bourgeois states. A majority of socialists voted in favor of revolutions, resolutions for the Second International to call upon the international working class to resist war if it were declared. But after the beginning of World War I, many European socialist parties announced support for their respective nations. Some ex exceptions were the British Labour Party and the Socialist Party of the Balkans. To Vladimir Lenin's surprise, even the Social Democratic Party of Germany voted in favour of war. After influential anti-war French socialist Jean Juarez was assassinated on 31st of July 1914, the Socialist parties hardened their support in France for the government of national unity. Socialist parties in neutral countries mostly supported neutrality rather than totally opposing the war. On the other hand, during the 1915 Zimmerwald Conference, Lenin organized an opposition to the imperialist war as the Zimmerwald left, publishing the pamphlet Socialism and War, 
where he called socialists collaborating with their national governments social chauvinists, i.e. socialists in word but nationalists in deed. The Zimmerwald left produced no practical advice for how to initiate a socialist revolt. The Second International divided into a revolutionary left wing, a moderate center wing and a more reformist right wing. Lenin condemned much of the center as social pacifists for several reasons, including their vote for war credits despite publicly opposing the war. Lenin's term social pacifist aimed in particular at Ramsay MacDonald, leader of the Independent Labour Party in Britain, who opposed the war on grounds of pacifism but did not actively fight against it. Discredited by its apathy toward world events, the Second International dissolved in 1916. In 1917, Lenin published the April Theses, which openly supported revolutionary defeatism where the Bolsheviks hoped that Russia would lose the war so that they could quickly cause a socialist insurrection. Impact of the Russian Revolution The victory of the Russian Communist Party in the Bolshevik Revolution of November 1917 was felt throughout the world and an alternative path to power to parliamentary politics was demonstrated. With much of Europe on the verge of economic and political collapse in the aftermath of the carnage of World War I, revolutionary sentiments were widespread. The Russian Bolsheviks, headed by Lenin, believed that unless socialist revolution swept Europe, they would be crushed by the military might of world capitalism, just as the Paris Commune had been crushed by force of arms in 1871. The Bolsheviks believed that this required a new international to foment revolution in Europe and around the world. First period of the Comintern During this early period, 1919-24, to 24, known as the first period in Comintern history, with the Bolshevik Revolution under attack in the Russian Civil War and a wave of revolutions across Europe, the Comintern's priority was exporting the October Revolution. Some communist parties had secret military wings, one example was the M. Apparat of the Communist Party of Germany. Its purpose was to prepare for the civil war the communists believed was impending in Germany and to liquidate opponents and informers who might have infiltrated the party. There was also a paramilitary organization called the Rotfront Kampferbund. The Comintern was involved in the revolutions across Europe in this period, starting with the Hungarian Soviet Republic in 1919. Several hundred agitators and financial aid were sent from the Soviet Union and Lenin was in regular contact with its leader, Bela Kun. Soon an official terror group of the Revolutionary Council of the Government was formed unofficially known as Lenin Boys. The next attempt was the March Action in Germany in 1921, including an attempt to dynamite the express train from Halle to Leipzig. After this failed, the Communist Party of Germany expelled its former chairman Paul Levy from the party for publicly criticizing the March action in a pamphlet which was ratified by the Executive Committee of the Communist International prior to the Third Congress. A new attempt was made at a time of the Ruhr crisis in spring and then again in selected parts of Germany in the autumn of 1923. The Red Army was mobilized, ready to come to the aid of the planned insurrection. Resolute action by the German government cancelled the plans except due to miscommunication in Hamburg where 200 to 300 communists attacked police stations but were quickly defeated. In 1924 there was a failed coup in Estonia by the Estonian Communist Party. Founding Congress The Comintern was founded at a congress held in Moscow on 2nd to 6th of March 1919. It opened with a tribute to Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg recently murmured by the Freikorps during the Spartacus uprising. 
against the backdrop of the Russian Civil War. There were 52 delegates present from 34 parties. They decided to form an executive committee with representatives of the most important sections and that other parties joining the international would have their own representatives. The Congress decided that the executive committee would elect a five-member bureau to run the daily affairs of the international. However, such a bureau was not formed and Lenin, Leon Trotsky and Christian Rakovsky later delegated the task of managing the international to Grigory Zinoviev as the chairman of the executive. Zinoviev was ass assisted by Angelika Balabanov, acting as the secretary of the international. Viktor L. Kibaltchik and Vladimir Osipovich Mazin. Lenin Trotsky and Alexandra Kolontai presented material. The main topic of discussion was the difference between bourgeois democracy and the dictatorship of the proletariat. The following parties and movements were invited to the founding Congress. Russian Communist Party, Bolsheviks. Spartacus League, Germany. Communist Party of German Austria. Hungarian Communist Workers' Party in power during Bela Kuhn's Hungarian Soviet Republic. Communist Party of Finland. Polish Communist Workers' Party. Communist Party of Estonia. Communist Party of Latvia. Communist Party of Lithuania, Communist Party Bolsheviks of Bielorussia, Communist Party Bolsheviks of Ukraine, Ukrainian section of Russian Communist Party, the revolutionary elements of the Czech Social Democracy, Social Democratic and Labour Party of Bulgaria, Tesinyatsi, Socialist Party of Romania, left wing of the Serbian Social Democratic Party, Social Democratic Left Party of Sweden, the Norwegian La Labour Party, for Denmark, the Klasse Kampen Group, Communist Party of the Netherlands, revolutionary elements of the Belgian Labour Party who would create the Communist Party of Belgium in 1921, groups and organisations within the French Socialist and Syndicalist movements, left wing within the Social Democratic Party of Switzerland, Italian Socialist Party, revolutionary elements of the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party, revolutionary elements of the Portuguese Socialist Party, British Socialist Parties, particularly the current represented by John McLean, Socialist Labour Party, United Kingdom, Industrial Workers of the World, United Kingdom, revolutionary elements of the workers' organisations of Ireland, revolutionary elements among the shop stewards, United Kingdom, Socialist Labour Party, United States. Left elements of the Socialist Party of America, the tendency represented by the Socialist Propaganda League of America. Industrial Workers of the World, United States. Industrial Workers of the World, Australia. Workers International Industrial Union, United States. The Socialist Groups of Tokyo and Yokohama. Japan represented by Sen Katayama. Socialist Youth International, represented by Willy Munzenberg. Of these, the following attended see list of delegates of the first Com Intern Congress. The Communist Parties of Russia, Germany, German, Austria, Hungary, Poland, Finland, Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarusia, Estonia, Armenia, the Volga German region, the Swedish Social Democratic Left Party, the Opposition, Balkan Revolutionary Peoples of Russia, Zimmerwald Left Wing of France, the Czech, Bulgarian, Yugoslav, British, French and Swiss Communist Groups, the Dutch Social Democratic Party, Socialist Propaganda League and the Socialist Labour Party of America, Socialist Workers' Party of China, Korean Workers' Union, Turkestan, Turkish, Georgian, Azerbaijan and Persian sections of the Central Bureau of the Eastern Peoples and the Zimmerwald Commission. Zinoviev served as the first chairman of the Comintern's executive committee from 1919 to 26, but its dominant figure until its death in January 24 was Lenin, whose strategy for revolution had been laid out in What is to be Done, 1902. The central policy 
of the Comintern under Lenin's leadership was that communist parties should be established across the world to aid the international proletarian revolution. The parties also shared his principle of democratic centralism, freedom of discussion, unity of action, namely that parties would make decisions democratically but uphold in a disciplined fashion whatever decision was made. In this period, the Comintern was promoted as the general staff of the World Revolution. Second World Congress Painting by Boris Kustodiev representing the festival of Comintern II Congress on the Ritsky Square, former Palace Square in Retrograd. Ahead of the Second Congress, the Communist International held in July through August 1920, Lenin sent out a number of documents including his 21 conditions to all socialist parties. The Congress adopted 21 conditions as prerequisites for any group wanting to become affiliated to the international. The 21 conditions called for the demarcation between communist parties and other socialist groups and instructed the Comintern sections not to trust the legality of the bourgeois states. They also called for the build-up of party organisations along democratic centralist lines in which the party press and parliamentary factions would be under the direct control of the party leadership. Regarding the political situation in the colonised world, the Second Congress of the Communist International stipulated that a united front should be formed between the proletariat, peasantry and national bourgeoisie in the colonial countries. Among the 21 conditions drafted by Lenin ahead of the Congress was the 11th thesis, which stipulated that all communist parties must support the bourgeois democratic liberation movements in the colonies. Notably, some of the delegates opposed the idea of alliance with the bourgeoisie and preferred giving support to communist movements in these countries instead. Their criticism was shared by the Indian revolutionary M. N. Roy, who attended as a delegate of the Mex Mexican Communist Party. The Congress removed the term bourgeois democratic in what became the eighth condition. Many European socialist parties divided because of the adhesion issue. The French section of the Workers' International, SFIO, thus broke away with the 1920 Tours Congress, leading to the creation of the new French Communist Party, initially called a French section of the Communist International, SFIC. The Communist Party of Spain was created in 1920. The Communist Party of Italy was created in 1921. The Belgian Communist Party in September 21, and so on. Third World Congress The Third Congress of the Communist International was held between 22nd of June to 12th of July 1921 in Moscow. Fourth World Congress The Fourth Congress held in November 1922 at which Trotsky played a prominent role continued in this vein. In 1924 the Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party joined Comintern At, far, at first in China, both the Communist Party of China and the Kuomintang were supported after the def definite break with Chiang Kai-shek in 1927. Joseph Stalin sent personal emissaries to help organize revolts, which at this time failed. Fifth to Seventh World Congresses, 1925 to 1935, Second Period. Picture of the Comintern membership card of Karl Kilbom. Lenin died in 1924 and the next year saw a shift in the organization's focus from the immediate activity of world revolution towards the defense of the Soviet state. In that year, Stalin took power in Moscow and upheld the thesis of socialism in one country, detailed by Nikolai Bukharin. In his brochure, Can We Build Socialism in One Country in the Absence of the Victory of the West European Proletariat? April 1925. The position was finalized as the state policy after Stalin's January 26 article on the issues of Leninism. Stalin made the party line clear. An internationalist is one who is ready to defend the USSR without reservation, without wavering, unconditionally for the USSR. It is the base of the world revolutionary movement, and this revolutionary movement cannot be defended and promoted without defending the USSR. 
The dream of a world revolution was abandoned after the failures of the Spartacist uprising in Germany and of the Hungarian Soviet Republic and the failure of all revolutionary movements in Europe, such as in Italy, where the fascist Squadristi broke the strikes and quickly assumed power following the 1922 march on Rome. This period up to 1928 was known as the second period mirroring the shift in the Soviet Union from war communism to the new economic policy. At the Fifth World Congress of the Comintern in July 1924, Zinoviev condemned both Marxist philosopher George Lukacs History and Class Consciousness published in 1923 after his involvement in Bela Kuhn's Hungarian Soviet Republic and Karl Korsh's Marxism and Philosophy. Zinoviev himself was dismissed in 1926 after falling out of favour with Stalin. Bukharin then led the Comintern for two years until 1928 when he too fell out with Stalin. Bulgarian Communist leader Georgi Dimitrov headed the Comintern in 1934 and presided until its dissolution. Jeff Elay summed up the change in attitude at this time as follows. By the 5th Comintern Congress in July 1924, the collapse of the communist support in Europe tightened the pressure for conformity. A new policy of Bolshevization was adopted which dragooned the CPs towards stricter bureaucratic centralism. This flattened out the earlier diversity of radicalisms, welding them into a single approved model of communist organization. Only then did the new parties retreat from broader left arenas into their own belligerent world. Even if many local cultures of broader cooperation persisted, Respect for Bolshevik achievements and defense of the Russian Revolution now transmuted into dependency on Moscow and belief in Soviet infallibility. Depressing cycles of internal rectification began, disgracing and expelling successive leaderships so that by the later 1920s many founding communists had gone. This process of coordination in a hard-faced drive for uniformity was finalised at the next Congress of the Third International in 1928. The Comintern was a relatively small organisation, but it devised novel ways of controlling communist parties around the world. In many places there was a communist subculture founded upon indigenous left-wing traditions which had never been controlled by Moscow. The Comintern attempted to establish control over party leaderships by sending agents who bolstered certain factions by judicious use of secret funding, by expelling independent-minded activists and even by closing down entire national parties, such as the Communist Party of Poland in 1938. Above all, the Comintern exploited Soviet prestige in sharp contrast to the weaknesses of local parties that rarely had political power. Communist Front Organizations Communist Front Organizations were set up to attract non-members who agreed with the party on certain specific points. Opposition to fascism was a common theme in the popular front era of the mid-1930s. The well-known names and prestige of artists, intellectuals and other fellow travelers were used to advance party positions. They often came to the Soviet Union for propaganda tours praising the future. Under the leadership of Zinoviev, the Comintern established fronts in many countries in the 1920s and after. To coordinate their activities, the Comintern set up international umbrella organizations linking groups across national borders such as the Young Communist International Youth, Prof Intern Trade Unions, Crest Intern Peasants, International Red Aid, Humanitarian Aid, Sport Intern, Organised Sports, and more. Front organisations were especially influential in France, which in 1933 became the base for communist front organiser Willy Munzenberg. 
these organizations were dissolved in the late 1930s or 1940s. Third period. In 1928, the ninth plenum of the Executive Committee began the so-called Third Period, which was to last until 1935. The Comintern proclaimed that the capitalist system was entering the period of final collapse and therefore all communist parties were to adopt an aggressive and militant ultra-left line. In particular, the Comintern labelled all moderate left-wing parties social fascists and urged the communists to destroy the moderate left. With the rise of the Nazi movement in Germany after 1930, this stance became controversial. The Sixth World Congress also revised the policy of the United Front in the colonial world. In 1927, the Kuomintang had turned on the Chinese communists, which led to a review of the policy on forming alliances with the national bourgeoisie in the colonial countries. The Congress did make a differentiation between the character of the Chinese Kuomintang on one hand and the Indian Swarajist Party and the Egyptian Waft Party on the other, considering the latter as an unreliable ally yet not a direct enemy. The Congress called on the Indian Communists to utilize the contradictions between the national bourgeoisie and the British imperialists. Seventh World Congress and the Popular Front The seventh and last Congress of the Common Term was held between 25th of July and 20th of August 1935. It was attended by representatives of 65 communist parties. The main report was delivered by Dimitrov. Other reports were delivered by Palmiro Toglietti, Wilhelm Pieck and Dmitry Manulski. The Congress officially endorsed the Popular Front against fascism. This policy argued that communist parties should seek to form a Popular Front with all parties that oppose fascism and not limit themselves to forming a united front with those parties based in the working class. There was no significant opposition to this policy within any of the national sections of the Comintern. In France and Spain it would have momentous consequences with Leon Blum's 1936 election which led to the Popular Front government. Stalin's purges of the 1930s affected Comintern activities living in both the Soviet Union and overseas. At Stalin's direction, the Comintern was thoroughly infused with Soviet secret police and foreign intelligence operatives and informers working under Comintern guys. One of its leaders, Mikhail Trisler, using the pseudonym Mikhail Alexandrovich Moskvin, was in fact chief of the foreign department of the Soviet OGPU, later the NKVD. At Stalin's orders, 133 out of the 492 Comintern staff members became victims of the Great Purge. Several hundred German communists and anti-fascists who had either fled from Nazi Germany or were convinced to relocate into the Soviet Union were liquidated and more than a thousand were handed over to Germany. Fritz Platten died in a labor camp and the leaders of the Indian Virendranath Chattopadhyaya or Chato, Korean, Mexican, Iranian and Turkish communist parties were executed. Out of 11 Mongolian communist party leaders and the Kolugin Chirbalsam survived. Leopold Trepper recalled these days. In-house, where the party activists of all the countries were living, no one slept until three o'clock in the morning. Exactly three o'clock, the li- car lights began to be seen. We stayed near the window and waited to find out where the car stopped. Dissolution. At the start of World War II, the Comintern supported a policy of non-intervention arguing that the war was an imperialist war between various national ruling classes, much like World War I had been. But when Soviet Union was invaded on 22nd of June 1941, the Comintern changed its position to one of active support for the Allies. 
on 15th of May 1943, a declaration of the Executive Committee was sent out to all sections of the International calling for the dissolution of the Comintern. The declaration read, The historical role of the Communist International organised in 1919 as a result of the political collapse of the overwhelming majority of the old pre-war workers' parties consisted in that it preserved the teachings of Marxism from vulgarization and distortion by opportunistic elements of the labor movement. But long before the war, it became increasingly clear that to the extent that the internal as well as the international situation of individual countries became more complicated, the solution of the problems of the labor movement of each individual country through the medium of some international center would meet with insuperable obstacles. Concretely, the, de the declaration asked the member sections to approve to dissolve the Communist International as a guiding center of the international labor movement, releasing sections of the Communist International from the obligations and issuing from the Constitution and and decisions of the Congress of the Communist International. After endorsement of the declaration were well received from the member sections, the international was dissolved. The dissolution was interpreted as Stalin wishing to calm his World War II allies, particularly Franklin D. Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, and to keep them from suspecting the Soviet Union of pursuing a policy of trying to foment revolution in other countries. Successor organizations, the research institutes 100 and 205 worked for the international and later were moved to the international department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Comintern was abolished in 1943, although its specific duties during the first several years of existence are unknown. Following the June 1947 Paris Conference on Martial Aid, Stalin gathered a grouping of key European Communist parties in September and set up the Commun Form, or the Communist Information Bureau. Often seen as a substitute to the Comintern, it was a network made up of the Communist parties of Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, France, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Romania, the Soviet Union, and Yugoslavia led by Josip Broz Tito, Yugoslavia was expelled in July 1948. The Commun Form was dissolved in 1956 following Stalin's 1953 death and the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. While the Communist Parties of the world no longer had a formal international organization, they continued to maintain close relations with each other through a series of international forums in the period directly after the Comintern's dissolution, periodical meetings of the Communist parties were held in Moscow. Moreover, World Marxist Review, a joint periodical of the Communist parties, played an important role in coordinating the Communist movement up to the breakup of the Socialist bloc in 1989 to 1991. Comintern sponsored international organizations. Several international organizations were sponsored by the Comintern in this period. Communist Youth International, 1919-43, Red International of Labor Unions, Prof. Intern, formed in 1920, Communist Women's International, formed in 1920, International Red Aid, MOPR, formed in 22, Red Peasant International, Crest Intern, formed in 1923, Red Sports International Sport in turn. International of the Proletarian Freethinkers, 1925 to 33. League Against Imperialism formed in 1927. Workers International Relief. International Liaison Department. The OMS Russian. Can't read that. Also known in English as the International Liaison Department, 1921 to 1939, was the most secret department of the Comintern. 
It has also been translated as the Illegal Liaison Section and Foreign Liaison Department. One historian has described, the OMS was the Comintern's department for the coordination of subversive and conspiratorial activities. Some of its functions overlapped with some of those, some of the main Soviet intelligence agencies, the OGPU and the GRU, whose agents sometimes were assigned to the Comintern, but the OMS maintained its own set of operations and had its own representative on the central committees of each Communist Party abroad. In 2012, historian David McKnight stated, the most intense practical application of the conspiratorial work of the common term was carried out by the International Liaison Office, the OMS. This body undertook clandestine courier activities and work which supported underground political activities. These included the transport of money and letters, the manufacture of passports and false documents and technical support to underground parties such as managing safe houses and establishing businesses overseas as cover activities. <laughs> World Congress on and Plenums of Comintern Congress is delegate figures of voting plus consultative. Plenums of ECCI Related meetings, Conference of the Amsterdam Bureau, Peoples of the East, Toilers of the Far East, World Congress Against Colonial Oppression and, and Imperialism, Second Congress of the League Against Imperialism, First International Conference of Negro Workers. So, that was the Communist International, which was preceded by the Second International. Second International, 1989-1916, no, 1889-1916, was an organisation of socialist and labour parties formed on 14th of July 1889 at a Paris meeting in which delegations from 20 countries participated. The Second International continued the work of the dissolved First International through excluding the powerful anarcho-syndicalist movement and trade unions. In 1922, the Second International began to reorganise into the Labour and Socialist International. So this was preceded by the International Working Men's Association. Or the First International. History among the Second International's famous actions were its 1889 declaration of 1st of May, May Day as International Workers' Day and its 1910 declaration of the International Women's Day first celebrated on 19th of March and then on 8th of March after the main day of the women's marches in 1917 during the Russian Revolution. It initiated the international campaign for the eight-hour working day. The international permanent executive and information body was the International Socialist Bureau, based in Brussels and formed after the International Paris Congress of 1900. Emile van der Velde and Camille Huysmans of the Belgian Labour Party were its chair and secretary. Vladimir Lenin was a member from 1905. The Second International became ineffective in 1916 during World War II because the separate national parties that composed the International did not maintain a unified pr front against the war, instead generally supporting their respective nations. The Secretary General of the ISB, Camille Huismans, moved the ISB from the German-occupied Brussels to The Hague in December 1914 and attempted to coordinate specialist parties from the warring states to at least July 1916. French section of the Workers' International SFIO leader Jean Juarez's assassination a few days before the beginning of the war symbolised the failure of the anti-militarist doctrine of the Second International. At the Zimmerwald Conference in 1915, anti-war socialists attempted 
to maintain international unity against the social patriotism of the social democratic leaders. In July at Geneva, the last Congress of the Second International was held following its functional collapse during the war. However, some European socialist parties refused to join the reorganized international and decided instead to form the International Working Union of Socialist Parties, IWUSP, second and a half international or two and a half international. Heavily influenced by Austro-Marxism, in 1923, IWUSP and the Second International merged to form the Social Democratic Labour and Socialist International, which continued to exist until 1940. After World War II, a new Socialist International was formed to continue the policies of the Labour and Socialist International, and it continues to this day. Another successor of the Third International, organized in 1919 by revolutionary socialists after the October Revolution and the creation of the Soviet Union, it was officially called the Communist International, Comintern, and lasted until 1943, when it was dissolved by the then-Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. Latin America. In Latin America, the International had two affiliates, namely the Socialist Party of Argentina and the Socialist Party of Uruguay. The exclusion of anarchists. Anarchists tended to be excluded from the Second International. Nevertheless, anarchism had in fact dominated the London Congress of the Second International. This exclusion received the criticism from anti-authoritarian socialists present at the meetings. It has been argued that at some point the Second International turned into a battleground over the issue of libertarian versus authoritarian socialism. Not only they represented minority rights, but also led the German Marxists into demonstrating dictatorial intolerance, which was a factor in preventing the British labor movement from following the Marxist direction indicated by such leaders as Henry Hindman. Libertarian versus Authoritarian Socialism Congresses and Conferences of the Second International says those congresses. After World War One there were three socialist conferences in Switzerland. These were as a bridge to the creation of the Labour and Socialist International. Bern Conference of nineteen nineteen in Bern, International Socialist Conference Lucerne. 1919, International Socialist Con Congress, Geneva, 1920, Related International Gatherings, Conference of Socialist Parties of Neutral Countries, Copenhagen, Conference of Central European Socialist Parties, Vienna, First Conference of the Zimmerwald Movement, Zimmerwald, Second Conference of the Zimmerwald Movement, Kienthal, Third Conference of the Zimmerwald Movement, Stockholm. First Conference of Inter-Allied Social Parties, London. Second Conference of Inter-Allied Socialist Parties, London. Third Conference of Inter-Allied Socialist Parties, London. Fourth Conference of Inter-Allied Socialist Parties, London. And so, does this go back further to the First International when you click on that, it's titled The International Working Men's Association. The International Working Men's Association, IWA, often called the First International, 1864 to 1876, was an international organization which aimed at uniting a variety of different left-wing socialist, communist and anarchist groups and trade unions that were based on the working class and class struggle. It was founded in 1864 in a workmen's meeting held in St. Martin's Hall, London. Its first congress was held in 1866 in Geneva. And there's an interesting symbol, a logo, first used by the Spanish IWA. So there's no predecessor. Founders were George Odger, Henri Tulane, Edward Spencer Beasley. 
Formation 28 September 1864, 155 years ago. Intergovernmental organisation. Purpose, defence of the working class, class struggle against capitalism, establishment of a socialist society. Headquarters, St James Hall, Regent Street, West End. Location, London, United Kingdom, 1864-73. to New York City, United States, 1873 to 1876. Members, 5 to 8 million. Key people, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, Mikhail Bakunin, Louis-Auguste Blanqui, Giuseppe Garibaldi. In Europe, a period of harsh reaction followed the widespread revolutions of 1848. The next major phase of revolutionary activity began almost 20 years later with the founding of the IWA in 1864. At its peak, the IWA reported having 8 million members, while police reported 5 million. In 1872, it split into two over conflicts between statist and anarchist factions and dissolved in 1876. The Second International was founded in 1889. Origins. Following the January uprising in Poland in 1863, French and British workers had started to discuss developing a closer working relationship. Henri Tolaine, Joseph Petacon, Charles Limousin visited London in July 1863, attending a meeting in St. James's Hall in honour of the Polish uprising. They discussed the need for an international organisation which would, amongst other things, prevent the import of foreign workers to break strikes. In September 1864, French and British delegates again met in London, this time to set up an organisation for sharing labour information across borders. St Martin's Hall meeting London, 1864. On 28 September, an international crowd of workers gathered to welcome the French delegates in St Martin's Hall, London. Among the many European radicals were English Owenites, followers of Pierre-Joseph Pradon, Louis-Auguste Blanqui, Irish and Polish nationalists, Italian Republicans and German socialists. Included among the last mentioned of this eclectic band, eclectic band was a somewhat obscure 46-year-old emigre journalist, Karl Marx, who would soon come to play a decisive role in the organisation. The positivist historian Edward Spencer Beasley, a professor at London University, was in the chair. His speech pilloried the violent proceedings of the government and referred to their flagrant breaches of international law and advocated a union of the workers of the world for the realisation of justice on earth. George Odger, secretary of the London Trades Council, read a speech calling for international cooperation. The meeting unanimously decided to found an international organisation of workers. The centre of was to be in London, directed by a committee of 21, which was instructed to draft a programme and constitution. Most of the British members of the committee were drawn from the Universal League of the Material Elevation of the Industrious Classes and were noted trade union leaders like Odger. George Howell, former secretary of the London Trades Council, which itself declined affiliation to the IWA, although remaining close to it. Cyrenus Osborne Ward and Benjamin Lucraft, and included Owenites and Chartists. The French numbers members were Denoual, Victor Lelubez, and Bosquet. Italy was represented by Fontana. Other members were Louis Wolfe, Johann Acarius, and the foot of the list, Marx, who participated in his individual capacity and did not speak during the meeting. The executive committee in turn selected a subcommittee to do the actual writing of the organisational program, a group which included Marx and which met at his home about a week after the conclusion of the St Martin's Hall Assembly. This subcommittee deferred the task of collective writing in favour of sole authorship by Marx and it was he who ultimately drew up the fundamental documents of the new organisation. On 5th of October, the General Council was formed with co-opted additional members representing other nationalities. It was based at the headquarters of the Universal League for the Material Elevation of the Industrious Classes at 18 Greek Street. Different groups offered proposals for the organisation. 
Louis Wolf, Mazzini's secretary, offered a proposal based on the rules and constitution of the Italian Working Men's Association, a Mazzinist organization, and John Weston, an Owenite, also tabled a program. Wolf left for Italy and Lubez rewrote it in a way which appalled Marx. Through deft manipulation of the subcommittee, Marx was left with all the papers and set about writing the address to the working classes to which was attached a simplified set of rules. International tensions. At first the IWA had mostly male membership, though in April 1865 it was agreed that women could become members. The international leadership was exclusively male. At the IWA General Council meeting on 16th April 1867. A letter from the secularist speaker Harriet Law about women's rights was read and it was agreed to ask her if she would be willing to attend council meetings. On 25 June 1867, Law was admitted to the General Council and for the next five years was the only woman representative. Due to the wide variety of philosophies present in the First International, there was conflict from the start. The first objections to Marx's influence came from the mutualists who opposed communism and statism. However, shortly after, Mikhail Bakunin and his followers, called collectivists, while in the International, joined in 1868. The First International became polarized into two camps, with Marx and Bakunin as their respective figureheads. Perhaps the clearest differences between the groups emerged over their proposed strategies for achieving their visions of socialism. The anarchist grouped around Bakunin favoured, in Peter Kropotkin's words, direct economic struggle against capitalism without interfering in the political parliamentary agitation. Marxist thinking at that time focused on parliamentary activity. For example, when the new German Empire of 1871 introduced male suffrage, many German socialists became active in the Marxist Social Democratic Party of Germany. Geneva Congress, 1866. During the Geneva Congress, the Paris group of Proudhonians dominated the discussions. Six Blanquists from Paris came to the Congress to denounce the French representatives as emissaries of Napoleon III, but they were thrown out. A significant decision at this event was the adoption of the eight-hour workday as one of the IWA's fundamental demands. The Lausanne Congress, 1867 the Lausanne Congress of the International was held on 2nd to the 8th of September 1867. Marx was unable to attend as he was working on the final proofs of Das Kapital. The Congress was attended by 64 delegates from Great Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, Italy and Switzerland. The reports delivered recorded the increased influence of the International on the working classes in various countries. The proud earnest delegates, primarily from France, influenced the orientation of the international's activity and its programmatic principles. Despite the efforts of the General Council's delegates, they succeeded in revising the resolutions of the Geneva Congress, passing a number of their resolutions, in particular on cooperation and credit. The Lausanne Congress confirmed the Geneva Congress resolutions on the economic struggle and strikes and passed a resolution on political freedom which emphasized that the social emancipation of workers was inseparable from political liberation. The Proudhonists also failed to seize the leadership of the International as the Congress re-elected the General Council in its former composition and retained London as its seat. The Lausanne Congress ignored the General Council's resolution and resolved officially to take part in the Congress of the League of Peace and Freedom. However, this Congress was attended by several General Council and some other international members and failed to resolve its political differences. Brussels Congress, 1868 the Brussels Congress of the International in 1868 approved Marx's tactics in regard to the League opposing official affiliation to the League, but calling upon the working class to combine efforts with all progressive anti-military forces. 
The Basel Congress, 1869. The Basel Congress took place on 6th to the 12th of September, 1869, according to Yuri Mikhailovich Steklov's account. Seventy-five delegates assembled from Great Britain, the six members of the General Council, Applegarth, Icarius, Cowell, Stepney, Lesnar, Lucraft and Jung, from France, which sent 26 delegates, among whom we may mention De Roo, Landrin, Shimav, Murat, Aubrey, Tolaine, A. Richard, Palix, Valin and Bakunin. Belgium sent five delegates, among whom were Hins, Brisme and De Pepe, Australia, Austria, two delegates, Neumeyer and Oberwinder. Germany sent ten delegates, among whom were Becker, Liebknecht, Rittinghausen and Hess. Switzerland had 22 representatives, among whom were Berkeley, Grulich, Fritz, Robert, Gulheim, Schwitzgebel and Pure. Italy sent but one delegate, Caparuso. From Spain there came Farga, Pelica and Sentinon and the United States of America was represented by Cameron. Jung was elected chairman of the Congress. The conference was mainly noted for the confrontation between the Proudhonists, mutualists, and the collectivist position defended by Marx's envoy for the General Council and Bakken in both. However, the Belgian socialist de Pape played a decisive role in bringing the Belgian delegation across to the collectivist side and isolating the mainly French Proudhonists. Hague Congress 1872. The fifth Congress of the IWA was held in early September 1872 in The Hague, the Netherlands, after the Paris Commune 1871. Bakunin characterized Marx's ideas as authoritarian and argued that if a Marxist party came to power, its leaders would end up as bad as the ruling class they had fought against, notably in his Statism and Anarchy. In 1872, the conflict in the first international climaxed with a final split between the two groups at the Hague Congress. This clash is often cited as the origin of the long-running conflict between anarchists and Marxists. The Hague Congress was notable for the attempted expulsion of Bakunin and Guillaume and for the decision to relocate the General Council to New York City. The main resolutions passed centred on committing the international to building political parties aimed at capturing state power as an indispensable condition for socialist transformation. After 1872, two first internationals. From then on, the Marxist and anarchist currents of socialism had distinct organizations at various points, including rival internationals. This split is sometimes called the Red and Black Divide red referring to the Marxists and black referring to the anarchists. Otto von Bismarck remarked upon hearing of the split at the first international that crowned heads, wealth and privilege may well tremble should ever again the black and red unite. The anarchist wing of the first international held a separate congress in September 1872 at St. Imier, Switzerland. The anarchists rejected the claim that Bakunin and Guillaume had been expelled and repudiated. The Hague Congress, as unrepresentative and improperly conducted. Over two days on 15 to 16 September 1872, at St. Imier, they declared themselves to be the true heirs of the international. See Anarchist St. Imier International. Bakunin's program was adopted. Marx was implicitly excluded and the anarchist first international ran until 1877 with some early growth in areas like Egypt and Turkey. The sixth Congress of the Marxist wing of the international was held in Geneva in September 1873, but it was generally considered to be a failure. The Marxist wing hobbled on until it disbanded three years later at the 1876 Philadelphia Conference. 
Attempts to revive the organization over the next five years failed. Since scholarship on the international is heavily shaped by different assessments of the importance and the effects of the Marx back and in conflict, different accounts emphasized different wings of the international and gave different dates of its final closure, 1876 or 77. The Second International was established in 1889 as a successor. Both anarchists and Marxists were involved in the new body in its early years. The International Working People's Association, the so-called Black International and Anarchist International, appeared in 1881, was mainly influential in the United States and Mexico and gradually disappeared after the late 1880s. At a congress in Berlin in 1922, the anarcho-syndicalists decided to re-found the first international as the International Workers' Association, which still exists. So, in this recording we've traced the Communist Party of Germany back through um, the funding by Comintern and then looking at the history of Comintern back to the uh, communist international groups and the International Working Men's Association. Um, if we now go back to the Communist Party of Germany, so their pre predecessor was the Spartacus League. And the Spartacus League was a Marxist revolutionary movement organized in Germany during World War I. The League was named after Spartacus, leader of the largest slave rebellion of the Roman Republic. It was founded by Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, Clara Zetkin and others. The League subsequently renamed itself the Communistische Partei Deutschlands KPD, joining the Comintern in 1919. Its period of greatest activity was during the German Revolution of 1918 when it sought to incite a revolution by circulating the newspaper Spartacus Letters. So their ideology was communism, Marxism and revolutionary socialism. History Liebknecht, the son of SPD founder Wilhelm Liebknecht, and Luxembourg became prominent members of the left-wing faction of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, SPD. They moved to found an independent organization after the SPD supported Imperial Germany's declaration of war on the Russian Empire in 1914 at the start of World War I. Besides their opposition to what they saw as an imperialist war, Luxembourg and Liebknecht maintained the need for revolutionary methods in contrast to the leadership of the SPD, who participated in the parliamentary process. The two were imprisoned from 1916 until 1918 for their roles in helping to organize a public demonstration in Berlin against German involvement in the war. After two years of war, op opposition to the official party line grew inside the SPD. More and more members of parliament refused to vote for war bonds and were expelled, which ultimately led to the formation of the Independent Social Democratic Party, the USPD. The Spartacus League was part of the USPD in its formation period. After the Russian Revolution of 1917, the Spartacus League began agitating for a similar course a government based on local workers' councils in Germany after the ab abdication of the Kaiser in the German Revolution of November 1918. A period of instability began, which lasted until 1923. On 9th of November 1918, from a balcony of the Kaiser's Berliner Stadtschloss, Liebknecht declared Germany a free socialist republic. However, earlier on the same night, Philip Schaderman of the SPD had declared a republic from the Reichstag. In December 1918, the Spartacusbund formally renamed itself the Communist Party of Germany, KPD. In January 1919, the KPD, along with the independent socialists, launched a Spartacist uprising. This included staging massive street demonstrations intended to destabilize the Weimar government 
led by the centrists of the SPD under Chancellor Friedrich Ebert. The government accused the opposition of planning a general strike and communist revolution in Berlin with the aid of the Freikorps, Free Corps. Ebert's administration quickly crushed the uprising. Luxembourg and Liebknecht were taken prisoner and killed in custody. Spartacist Manifesto of 1918 An excerpt from the Spartacist Manifesto. The question today is not democracy or dictatorship. The question that history has put on the agenda reads bourgeois democracy or socialist democracy. For the dictatorship of the proletariat does not mean bombs, putsches, riots and anarchy as the agents of capitalist profits deliberately and falsely claim. Rather, it means using all instruments of political power to achieve socialism to expropriate the capitalist class. Through and in accordance with the will of the revolutionary majority of the proletariat. Prominent members George Gross, Leo Jogiches, Paul Levy, Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, Julian Marchlewski, Ernst Mayer, Franz Mehring, William Peek, August Talheimer, Bertha Talheimer, and Clara Zetkin. So that was the Spartacus League, which became the Communist Party of Germany. And they were succeeded by the Socialist Unity Party of Germany, East Germany, the German Communist Party, West Germany, and the Socialist Unity Party of West Berlin. Um, but that's as far as we're going to go in this video, audio. And we'll continue on in the next one.